Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Sitting here with the uh, rather wonderful Mr. Stevie Black, how are you? Ah, good to see you. Good to see you too. We're at the uh, Launchpad Studios, and we came here a little while ago before you built this extra part, mm -hmm. and we did a course which everybody has to look out for because it's coming out on Christmas Day. But well, you know the best thing about it is it's coming out as a free holiday gift from Mr. Stevie uh, Black. Yay. Well, so thank you. No, it's amazing. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that because I want to build a little bit of anticipation. The project is a, it, it's my side project when I have time and, you know, I'm not busy doing ever, everyone else's music. Every song has a different singer and different writers involved, but it's all me kind of directing and figuring out, you know, coming up with a, a groove music jam. And the whole project is The Rocket Ship of Love is about sexy, groovy, 70s themed, modern, modernized, I guess. You got so, some amazing players on the track, Chef. Uh, Jeff Babco, of course, playing keys on some stuff I heard earlier, which was phenomenal. Well, that's uh, Leah Zeger's album, solo album that I, yeah. I produced and co-write with her. So, and, um, and she is the singer on this song. She is the singer on this song. Leah's a phenomenal singer. She's more known as a violinist, even though she's really one of the best singers, I think, in town. I met her because I needed someone to play with Miley for MTV Unplugged. And Marvelous. Lee, her name came around. So, <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. So if you come back on the 25th, which will be on the Wednesday, there will be a video and a link to download those multitracks, which are phenomenal. Because what people ask me about all the time is strings. How oh. do I record strings? Well, uh -huh. that's what you do. That's what you don't I just do. record them yourself in I, this room over here. I you play them. And you arrange it all. <laughs> and I arrange it. So you're going to get to see inside of Stevie's mind on this one. <laughs> Good luck with that. Let's do a little uh, little name droppy stuff here. We so see we have Funhouse by Pink on the wall there, the million selling album. Oh, oh yeah, that was a, well past that now. Yes, right. That was a great album to play on. It was a song that's called Sober that Tony Canal and Jimmy, such a good song. Jimmy Harry co-wrote and produced together. Tony. The bass player of no doubt of course yep. 10 o'clock at night i'm here in my studio working on the track tony calls me pink's here he wants to come over to your place and check out what you're doing they all piled over came over like checked it out pink yeah pink yeah in, in here. this room yeah pink shows up she's like i love the violin show me something you know takes off her shoes and just like <laughs> <laughs> and like picks up my violin and i show her a little thing and, and then you know it was just a great experience to, to work with her and then we ended up doing that that song on the AMAs a few few months later. And since then, I've done a few other albums with her. I just did the new album duet with her and Chris Stapleton. And oh, amazing! So yeah. she's, she's an incredible singer. She is. She's and she's the real deal. I mean, every oh no, like, unbelievable. I've got some outtakes from that sober session that you know every one of them sounds amazing, but. Not none of them are the ones they ended up using. <laughs> I mean, as everybody who's ever watched a video of mine, I'm sure you know, I am the hugest Queen fan, and I mm. remember her. That's about it's about eight or ten years ago now. Yeah, um, her version of Bohemian Rhapsody, which you can mm. find live on YouTube. There's wow. many different. It's unbelievable. Huh. Her I'm and her band just nail it. And yeah, she's she's one of the. One of the best singers. Yeah, I agree. Out there, yeah. That song's so good, though. Mark, uh, we should do a link, definitely. Eric definitely has put a link to Sober. That's a song that's worth everybody's time. Great vocal, sure. but just great, great oh, song. Yeah. Thank you. So um, give us give us a little bit more highlights. <laughs> I mean, I can see lots of uh, nice gold and platinum-looking records in there. Let's um, see. I did a Timberland's first solo album. Is that the one that had uh, One Republic on it? Yep. Right. I, was, and I remember that album well. That was, and I did the track with Elton John. So oh. they sent me they sent me Tim's beat and Alton's piano and said do something with this. Oh, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, that's it's terrifying, Alton John. but also yeah. a dream. What exactly, a dream. so fun, so cool. Oh, you know, congratulations. Yeah, I also realized that I need to mix my strings as best I can sound them before I send them back. Otherwise, they might just end up how I sent them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think for uh, me, when I get strings to mix, quite often I, I trust the arranger and the engineer who recorded them because yeah. I think that they have the balance they way, the way they want it to be. Exactly. So. That was one thing I learned on that session. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> they don't sound exactly how I would have done them, but, you know, right. it, they, they sound good. Been fortunate enough to work with such a huge variety from, like, Joe Cocker and Cher, Foreigner have done some, some stuff with them, Matchbox 20, they were great guys, you know, and Rob's solo album also I've worked on Wonderful. that. Wonderful. I can see a Spotify yeah. playlist under here. Yeah, right. We'll put a Spotify playlist up. I've, I've got one with everything I've got on it. 
Oh. <laughs> that I've played on. So. Okay, well then we're going to get that. And we're going to copy and paste it below. There you go. Wonderful. But I've also been, you know, done a lot of like uh, Hispanic music and 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 hip hop and you know, yeah, see the Latin Grammy, Latin Grammys. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I love how strings can fit in every style of music. Which, yeah. I will yeah. say there's just something enduring, something and something so satisfying about the fact that. You know, maybe rock guitar comes and goes. It's hip this week. It's not hip that way. Mm. Sometimes I hear a funk track, and for right. about six months, there's funk guitars and lots of pop songs. <laughs> but strings, they just bring so much class, and and they can do so many. They can fulfill so many roles. Mm -hmm. You know, because the Definitely. complexity of all of those instruments, even with you just recording a quartet, there's four individual instruments that have totally different frequency ranges that can mm -hmm. just do, can convey so much emotion. Oh, definitely. And they'll never go to style. No. That's true, and and they're so you know you can't copy in the MIDI, yeah. You can't quite get the same kind of feel, right. which is good for me. <laughs> That's fantastic. And ultimately, you always need somebody who can arrange the parts. Exactly. So being a great keyboard player is a good start, but understanding yeah, how things I, I get relate. String arrangements from keyboard players, and it's like two hands. Yeah. You know, always two hands. Yeah. More notes than a, a string section would ever play. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you, if, if you're a keyboard player and you're writing a string arrangement, think about the four people that are going to play that for the quartet. Yeah. You know, how many notes can they actually play? And what sure. what notes are really important to, to stick out and what notes are just going to mud muddy up the, the vocals? Sure. And Where were you born? Where did you come from? I was born in London. My parents had, were American that happened to move over there for six months and I popped out. And uh, grew up in Ohio, a um, small town called Oberlin, which is a very liberal arts college town, great music school there. Um, my father was a piano professor and my mom was a singer. They met at Juilliard. Yeah, you know, so I grew up with the music <laughs> in my head, in my bones. Did you go to music school and end up out here? What was your, what was your I, journey? After high school, went to Berkeley College. Two years into that, I took some time off and moved to California to study with David Grisman, mandolin, jazz mandolin virtuoso. And then I went back to Boston to finish in college and the violin teacher was like well i'll show you some mandolin things but you have to learn to play violin so i didn't pick up the violin until i was 21. oh fantastic yeah. <laughs> but now you're yeah that's yeah. That, that's one of your main sources of revenue exactly yeah <laughs> a player but also obviously an arranger and 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 I, the fact I, that you I consider this. myself a musician like I, okay i'm not i play guitar i play bass i play you know pretty much anything with strings but you know, it's for me. It's all about the music. It's it's twelve notes, and it's all the way you you know you put those notes together. <laughs> Fantastic on whatever instrument it might be. Then I presume you came back to California, or was there a little journey in between? After went back to Boston and yep. graduated from Berkeley. Yeah, I moved back to San Francisco. Actually, I was touring in a few bands. Toured with Dan Hicks, who passed away a few years ago, but he was a, a legendary '60s San Francisco you know uh, artist. Toured with Vince Welnick, who was the last keyboard player with the Grateful Dead and used to play with the Tubes. And I had Steve Kimmock in the band. And so very San Vega, Francisco. Very thing, San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I played with Sputnik Spooner and, you know, like wow. ca cats like that. Mm -hmm. And what were you playing? Were you playing guitars or violin? Or, I was always both? kind of a, a, a multi-instrumental guy. So I, usually they'd have me pl play mandolin and violin or mandolin, violin and guitar sometimes and, you know, whatever, whatever was needed for the gig. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. How did you end up here in uh, sunny Los Angeles? By the mid late 90s things had kind of died up there as far as touring and I was like well if I'm going to be a side guy or a session guy I might as well move to LA where the work is you know um, which San Francisco is a great place to live but it's hard to make a living there as you know most musicians know. <laughs> yeah absolutely. And LA is just you know has a lot more opportunities in that sense so I moved here in 98 one of the first people I hooked up with was Mike Elizondo and Lyle Workman, and those guys kind of turned me on to some work and some other introduced me to some other people and started getting calls for hip hop albums. <laughs> you know, so some of the first artists I was working with in, in 98, 99 was Snoop Dogg, Ice Cube. Fantastic. Uh, you know, all sorts of, you know. Um, 
And were you doing string arrangements or? I was, or? at that time I was still, I hadn't picked up a cello yet. So I was still doing violin. They'd have me come in and kind of do arrangements, but do it on the fly. Like, and the hip hop thing, it was either like an eight bar segment or a 16 bar segment. So it would be like, you know, we record 16 bars. We'd multi-track over that, you know, th thicken it up. And then uh, they'd put it in their MPC and they'd play it in the, <laughs> you know, press the button and, you know, my arrangement would be done. That was what was so gritty and, and uh, real yeah. about that music of that period. I mean, sometimes we'd even go in with like reels of tape and, you know, do it the old old school way, yep. you know, yep. <laughs> which was always a bit of a nightmare for me because then I'd like, if I messed up, I'd have to wait until the tape rewound and, you know, yep. everything was three times longer than, <laughs> ah. than, it, than it is with digital, but, you know. It, it sounded great. <laughs> it is strange remembering yeah. those days, isn't it, when we oh, used, yeah. to, used to hear yeah, right. come back, <laughs> and you had that sort of 20 seconds to think, oh, I've got to punch in. Mm -hmm. But then if you made a mistake and you know exactly what it was, you'd be frustrated waiting yeah. waiting for the beginning of the take. The right. whole 20 seconds was like, took seemed to last forever. Mm -hmm. Now when I work with uh, people and they get impatient with the punch in, you're like, <laughs> yeah, right, come on. <laughs> and then, so, you know, I was learning basically you know, going into these sessions and learning how to do arrangements, figuring out like what sounded good together, what doesn't work together, you know, and, and just doing it all on the fly. And I still do arrangements every once in a while on a song, like someone will give it to me. I won't write anything down. I'll just go in the studio and start kind of playing a cello line and then add some violin on top of it and do it all in my head. But most of the time I prefer to, to write it out first. So I know what I'm doing. Wait, they're in the course. Did you do it? You did it more in your head, didn't you? Yeah. All yeah. in my head. <laughs> yeah, that one's all in your head, yeah. 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 That was gone, and you get to see it in real time. <laughs> so that's going to be fantastic. Come back on Wednesday. One of the things that uh, strikes me as you're talking about this is the, the difference between, you know, in anything in life is going to school right. and learning something. Sure. And then doing it for real and realizing that, you know, th those two things don't necessarily equate. You can get the technical knowledge, but doing it, being in a room, especially, you know, you're talking about working with hip hop artists or pop artists or rock artists, everybody has their own methodology. Mm -hmm. Every, they might want the same great results, but they get there in totally different ways. Yes. And you have to be able yeah. to morph between those people. Definitely. And nowadays, I mean, you know, if I do an arrangement, I'll do it in MIDI first so the artist or, you know, or the producer, whoever I'm working with, can hear it and know kind of what it's going to be like before, before you know, we go into the session. It right. It's easier. <laughs> Unless it's your own stuff, like you Unless did with, uh, with, with this song. <laughs> yeah. It's fantastic. You've been killing it. I mean, you're everywhere. I'm, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm I don't think you're lucky. Let lucky me and grateful. When I first started getting, you know, uh, success outside of being a musician as a producer and an engineer. I used to get an email from you like maybe once a month or once every yeah, other month. Probably something and, like that. And Mike Flynn as well, when right. Mike and I were working together. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, cause it, and, and be like, hey, if you're looking for anything, I'm available. Here's uh, what I've yeah. been working on recently. <laughs> Check out my recent work. Right. <laughs> and it got to a point, I remember, when I was doing Jamie Hartman's record. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. so... Yeah, I was, you know, I, I got an email from this guy, Stevie Black. What do you think? And I was like, you know what? You should use him. You yeah. know, he no, seems. Jamie was great. I, yeah. That was a, such a fun album. Yeah, fun project. I, I produced that album. <laughs> yeah, he sure. did that with, he did that here just with you one to one. Right. But it's, it's a lesson to be learned. There is a, there is that line between being <laughs> proactive. Right. You know, and getting in. Self promotion. And, and, yeah, and self promotion. That. It's okay. But you don't. You never approached it with like you have to use oh, no, me. No. I'm amazing. No, 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 yeah. no. Of course not. No, it's always you know because and the thing with strings is it's so subjective and that you can go sure. so many different ways. You know, it's 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 really for me. It's about like what feels best for the song and what's going to work best for you know for the artist and the song and you know staying away from their vocals, staying in you know or or complementing them depending on you know, where we're at in the track. The self-promotion thing, I mean, it, it's important because no one's going to get out there and, you know, talk you up better than you, you know. Yeah. Unless you have a manager who is always better at talking me up than I am. <laughs> right. Right. I like to stay a little, you know, a little more humble and more, you know, I, as good as someone might think I am, I, I'm not nearly that good. You know what I mean? Of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, yeah. we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, exactly. aren't we? So everybody that, you know, I've, I've made records with, 
guys that I grew up listening to their albums. So mm -hmm. all I can be is just like a footnote to a footnote. Exactly. At best. <laughs> I'm an asterisk, 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 asterisk in, in, in maybe if I'm lucky in the story of their life. Exactly. <laughs> maybe. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I feel very fortunate. And, and part of it's also, as you know, like part of having a career in this town is in, in LA or in, in music in general, is you got to be sociable. You got to be, you know, someone that people want to hang out with. Absolutely. You, yeah. know, you can't be a dick or a jerk and, and, you know, think that everyone's just going to use you because you're great. Sure. I talked about this the other day in, in a, um, a Fact Friday is like, I, I would say every musician that's ever worked for me has made a much better hourly rate than I ever made on the project. So <laughs> like maybe somebody rate. gives me a certain amount of money to make a record. I'll bring in players that are getting probably three to four times an hour what I'm getting. Sure. And, and they, they need to long walk long. away. And sometimes they're working for less money. It's because I'm getting paid less money. Oh, sure. But if you get all of these players around town thinking, oh, you know what, Stevie's a great guy, he rewards me, he pays me well when he can, then you build yeah. a lot of goodwill. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Or, you know, I'll do you a favor, you do me a favor, and, sure. and that, you know, comes around as well. Definitely, yeah. definitely. And I'm, I'm happy to do that with, you know, good friends and, and people I work with. So. Marvelous. With the quartet, you've got presumably four mics set up, but you've also have room mics set up. Well... Am I playing it or are other people playing it? I think it's when so, you're playing it, so you're when moving I'm, around. When I'm playing it and moving around, I use basically a U47 on, as a close mic, and I use a Telefunken, say, 70, which one's the, the stereo Telefunken there. Also a tube mic. So. I do want to say all of this is going to be in the course, by the way. Uh -huh. You're going to see all of this in the course, so you can watch this. And you can download it, download it for free on Wednesday. Have I said that enough? And I end up mixing more of the room usually than than the close mic because it just you know it has a that space and and depth to it that you know. But the close mic's good to have as you know if you want to add some grit or sometimes the mixer will just you know want a really close cello and kind of far away violins that kind of thing. So it's nice to have the option for whoever's song it is. But what's um, great about um, the room mics and the way that you record is that you move into <laughs> each position of the quartet. Exactly. So if you bring up the room mics on each of the four elements, they are placed in the right place. Exactly. Do so you I'll, then sum those together? Uh, I usually do a full submix of everything together, yeah. 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 Maybe so, add any sort of reverb lightly to the whole thing so they all then glue together? Exactly. Which And, and that's the final step that, that, that just really kind of gels it and, Beautiful. and makes it kind of work together. So, what are your favorite pre's on the close mics and favorite pre's on the rooms? I love the the Neve type pre's. So I've got a Aurora Audio, but I don't like the old Neves where you have to get them fixed every six months. And you know, sure. I mean, they sound great, but when they're not working, they're just a disaster. So I love the Aurora. Um, yep. Jeff Tanner is doing some great stuff, and I'm I love the Vintex. Um, you know, what are your preferences? Is this close mics? I use the. The, the Aurora? Aurora for close mic and the Vintech for room mics. Great. The Aurora, I also go through a 6176, just the, the 1176 part of it. Yeah. Um, occasionally, I'll, I'll run the room mic through a compressor, but usually not. I, I you know, because it's not such a close mic, it, it's the volume issues aren't as, you know, yeah. aren't as big. Yep. Um, yep, totally. And that's about it. I try and keep it as clean and, and easy as possible. So you just so. tap you're just tapping the six one seventy six to get light compression on it? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. What about the uh ACA three three six oh nine or Vintex the, version the, of that, the six oh nine? Like I said, sometimes I'll run the, the stereo mics through okay. that. Or occasionally I'll if I'm doing like a really yep. important album, yep. <laughs> I'll run everything. I'll run the whole string mix through the six oh nine. Okay. Which also kind of gels it together and, and and just gives it a nice warmth. Is this a mic pre down here? That's an Alembic bass pre. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which sounds great for acoustic also, um, acoustic guitars. But you put a DI into it? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I, I used, really want to hear that. I used to use it for my live rig, um, yep. for my acoustics and my mandolin. Yep. I, had it, I had it split like an AB switch instead of a tone yep. boost. I must ask you, are you yeah. all, do you always work on your own or do you have an assistant? I always work on my own. So I'm, you're doing I, all of this, set up a template, go in there. Yeah, I mean, are I, you remotely activating it from an iPad or an iPhone? Or? No, I use um, a remote desktop on my laptop okay. to, to control my desktop computer. Right, um, which is the only way, like, 
because then I have the full image that's on my desktop. Yeah. I have all the keystrokes, everything's exact and pretty, you know, pretty much instant. That's amazing. No lag time. Yeah. I've been doing that since 2002. I mean, how many square feet do you think it is? Uh, in there or the whole Just thing? Just general. In there would be nice to know. I think, well, it's about an 18 by 20 room. So, you know, 300, 400, 400, 400 almost. And then another 300 here. So. It's got a relatively high, not super high, but a relatively high ceiling. 11 so can, feet. 11 feet. So you can get a the, bit of room out height. of it. Yeah. Which, yep. you know, I when I built it, I tore the roof off and added this room and then did us one long roof line all the way across. Did it originally start off as like a two-car garage? That was the garage. This was empty. This was outside. <laughs> oh, okay. So I built this room, added that. Was that a single or double garage? Double garage. Double garage. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So it gives it gives people a lot of idea of, of what you can do with this kind of space. And the contractor that I used, uh, well, he was more of a friend of mine and didn't really oversee the whole thing, but he also built Steve Vai's studio. Ah, the one in, in his back garden. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. I love it, yeah. So this is a little mini version of, of Vi's place. <laughs> yeah, which is wonderful which, as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've got, so you, you, you're favoring the Vintex, but obviously the Jeff, Jeff Tanners, Aurora Audio, yep. Pre's here for most of your close mics, Vintex for rooms. You're going into the either 6176s or the Vintex version of the uh, 33609, the 609CA. Mm -hmm. uh, the Line 6, what are you using that for? That's for your, a bass tone? Usually when, I, when I'm doing bass on certain things, yeah. Yep. Um, I either go through here or just go direct into a... You know, actually kind of like the UAs for going bass direct. And then you've yeah. got a rather beautiful looking Trident. <laughs> Trident. What was that? This was something that Guitar Center made with Trident. Really? At, like 15 years ago, and they were trying to talk it. And, wow. you know, I think it was a thousand bucks for two channels. And, and it's actually pretty decent. It's a little high endy. So I like it on overheads, on, okay. on drum overheads, which, you know, brings out the real Christmas in a, in a cymbal kind of. Kind of right. thing. The overstayer equipment I have is, is yep. great stuff. Jeff um, Terzo's, you know, making some really nice. nice you work know, he, there. we have to go and interview him, and I yeah. keep saying this in every video. <laughs> Jeff's stuff in everybody I respect's place. Everybody <laughs> yeah, <right>. has overstayer. <laughs> yeah. So, firstly, I have to buy some. Number one, <laughs> and number two, I have to go and interview him. Yeah, he's a good dude. He's he, and he, everybody he knows his stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we and I've known him for years, also since before he started this company, and we were. You know, I think we he used me on some strings for this other thing that we were he was producing right. at the time, and we you know. Now the three one two fours. Um, what what are they getting used on? I'm using them when I produce other people, pretty much just on the drum kits. APIs are so, wonderful on drum kits. Exactly. I used to have four of those on, 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 yeah. on and and they were amazing across a drum kit. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. So and then I'll also yep. use my room mic. Yeah. Um, on, for the drums. With the with the Vintex, but two seventy sixes very close to those. I I know those very well. The yeah, UK right? sound. <laughs> I love it. It's a new piece of equipment for me, but it, it's uh, it sounds great. And then the DBX is amazing on either yeah. bass or a kick drum. Yeah. yeah. Talking of mics, let's go and check out what those mics are. Sure. So this is your main close mic. Yeah. So this is a, <laughs> a Sound Deluxe U forty seven. If you look on the bottom, it says Proto. It's the prototype that um, David Bach made out of all original U47 parts. Oh, wow. <laughs> How long have you had it? I've had it about 10 years, 8 or 10 years. A Amazing. friend of mine was working at Sound Deluxe, which is a post audio post for TV and film. Yeah. Um, and they had these in the closet. Wow. And he's like, this has to be used. Someone, someone a friend of mine needs it. And should should buy it, so I ended up buying it from wow. from the company. <laughs> That's absolutely amazing. So, and it's a beautifully sounding mic. I've also I've had a uh, some old forty sevens in here and AB dumb, and as as any two are different, it's the same. You know. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, we we have this conversation yeah. about forty sevens yeah. all the time. Yeah, <laughs> they have this enormous variety of. What what what's of course is amusing is they can all sound good, but in different oh, yeah. ways. Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, and they all have their own character. You know? So is that C twenty four? It's it's the, it's the telephone conversion. The telephone conversion of oh, the C twenty four. These are a third of the price or a quarter of the price of you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. I'd probably stay with that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and they sound good. I mean, and I had um, I had a a tube upgraded in there. So wonderful. Yeah. You know. 
Yeah. Uh, so you have a pair of 121s on the piano? 122s. Oh, 122s. I like having a little bit of headspace there. You yeah. Know, great. I like the Mojaves on the overheads. I've also used them on guitars, vocals occasionally. You know, right. Especially, or even like when I'm when I do have a live string quartet in here, yeah. I set up a little deca tree kind of thing, and I'll use those with the. I wonder if know, anybody can right. tell on these little mics, but you can actually. There's room. Oh yeah. There's some room in this room, even though you know essentially it's three four hundred square feet. But the the other thing that makes it roomy is the resonance from all the instruments hanging around. So like, yeah, you know, you can hear. Yeah, toms and guitars, and pianos and, open, yeah. and all that, yeah. which really adds to the ambience of the of the space. It's fantastic. Know? So if I'm playing like a a low note or something, you know, like oh yeah, it just rings. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> amazing. Before we get into all of those stringed and drums and all this stuff. Uh -huh. You got a sitar sitting over here. I've got a sitar. That's quite an adventurous thing. <laughs> yeah, this is fun. I've I've had this for many years, and I just recently broke it out again. But yeah, but even better than this is the S rush. The one hanging. Oh yeah, we can, yeah. Ah, these things are. Fun yeah. to play. <laughs> that's that's a whole different ball game. I'll, 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 leave, I'll leave you uh, to play that one. How old is that? This one, I, I don't know. I bought it on Amazon, I think, 15, 10, 15 years ago. Right. Was it new then? It was new, yeah. Oh, okay. This one is interesting. This one I got. Lyle Workman bought this when he joined Vex Band to tour. Yeah. Because Smokey Hormel had one. Yeah. And Lyle's like, I don't know how to use a bow. Yeah. <laughs> he ended up giving it to me. I ended up playing it on yeah. a movie soundtrack he, he wrote, you know, in yeah. exchange, yeah. basically. But um, it's often used with the sitar, so. Oh. Yeah. The Beatles. And George Harrison uh, fans here. Yeah. Right. I did a really fun track with um, the Fratellis last year it came out that really features this instrument. It's such a beautiful song. Um, and it's so fun to, to do it, you know. I'm probably, you know, my technique, if you Talk to some Indian school Indian artist, would sure. I'd be horrible. But you know, it, I, I, I get a tone out of it. And it we, works. we do we do what we can. <laughs> no, exactly. But that was beautiful. Oh, Absolutely thank you. fantastic. <laughs> it's a fun one. I, I like that. I see you have a, yeah. a, a sitar guitar up there. I, I, I have that too. Yeah. <laughs> I have one of those, and we've always we Eric and I always joke about it. We can never actually find a song to put it in. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's like you start playing. This is so cool, and then it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> these are fun. This is a mandolin, mandola, and a mando cello. Both of these are over 100 years old now. Wow. Gibsons. And this one was made for my old teacher, and um, I don't think the, the company, Kentucky, made any more than, like, four. Wow. That's fantastic. So, so can you, do, you can be your own mandolin orchestra. I have been. Mand orchestra. One of uh, <laughs> the last Leah Zeger song that we released has yeah. a mandolin quartet. And then it turns into a string quartet. Oh, wow. So. Fun thing about this is you can be. You know, you can do bass lines or yeah. you can be a rhythm. Do 
do all sorts of stuff. So noisy. <laughs> or you can do a bluegrass one. <laughs> so amazing. Hmm. You're moving between all kind. I mean, because look, we, we, this is to say we just start here, for instance. <laughs> we start here with frets about, you know, whatever yeah. that is, right. a centimeter between, and then you end up over here. Exactly. You're probably, I mean, this is where you need a well developed ear <laughs> because it's not always just about, like, you know. You, oh, no, yeah. yeah. You, you need a well developed ear. I mean, some ear. of it's muscle memory. Like, right. But, yeah. I also I cheat a little bit and you know put fret lines where I don't blame you. Beautiful. <laughs> oh yeah, that's fantastic. And there's nothing better than a bowed sound in double bass as well. Mm -hmm. Just that growl is just so unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, one yeah. heck of a collection there of violins. Mm -hmm. um, is there a, a story behind these? Is there a favorite one, a go-to that you use? Well, I mean, this is my first one. This was a, it's a really beautiful instrument. Um, It's just a you know a lovely sounding instrument. Nothing really special about it. Who's it made by? Uh, it's a Fawick from the '60s. Yeah. Which, uh, from '69, it was a. Oh, yeah, see the date. A company in Ohio that they imported the the wood pre card from Germany. Yeah. And then they put it together there and put their name on it. And oh, okay, interesting. So it's you know, and then this one is similar. <laughs> this is a five string I bought. I, oh. Um, so it goes down to viola range. I can't remember the company on this, but um, Nicholas Parola, no, that's not it. But, um, which for a five string violin, it's hard to find a good one that plays well and sounds good, so. Sounds um, beautiful. And then I put a LR bags on it to be able to electrify it whenever I want. And, yeah. do, you play that, do you play that live or do you put it through amps and stuff? To... I'll put it through amps. Sometimes I've even put it through a talk box. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Which I is interesting because then you got to get up to the mic. Yeah. And when you're playing, you get, you get obviously the mic's going to pick up the, the yeah. acoustic instrument, but then you also get the, the wah-wah sound from the, yeah. from the talk box. Um, yeah. This instrument was... Probably, probably the oldest one I have, which is actually my wife's from her high school. <laughs> Every violinist I, I know that comes over and wants to pick up an instrument tend to go for this one first. Yep. Yeah. Just, it's a beautiful, beautiful instrument. Anyways, yeah. Amazing. And then this one here, what's this one? This one yep. I bought at a fiddle competition, <laughs> Topanga fiddle contest. I used to be a judge. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's interesting, as soon as you picked <laughs> up and played just one note, it was all mid-range. It started sounding like a f like that kind of fiddle, mm. and then you played the part, and <laughs> yeah. so they, I, 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 see it's how naive I am to think that they have this much Character difference, although I oh, see yeah. that this is a little deeper, the one that's yep. the five string. So actually a little bit bigger than a normal violin too. Right, so it's a slightly bigger body, slightly deeper, yep. allowing that low, extra low string to kind of shine. Exactly, and this one I found at a pawn shop for like a couple hundred bucks. But... So what is your main tracking violin? Uh, when I'm doing a string quartet, most likely I would either use these two or this one and that, and then right. the cello and the viola. If right. I'm doing a larger section, I use them all. And that kind of helps give it a different... Because different, um, they all slightly intonate a little exactly. bit differently. They all, they all play a little different. They sound, have different tones. Good idea. Know, yeah. So it, it really helps. I have yeah. a 
second cello, but it's not here right now, but um, another cello also that I use. And then for the viola, I can use the five string as well to go down with, That's very small. with the viola. Yeah. So here's your viola. Here's the viola. It's just similar to the violin, just a little deeper, a little bit bigger. Beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely beautiful. I love the sound of the viola. Yeah. Just, I do too. I, Some people are like, ah, I can't stand it. I, really? I, I love that throaty kind yeah, of. Yeah, me too. Yeah. But I, in, in, of all of the, 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 I suppose, classical instruments, the cello is easily my favorite. Yeah. That's such a beautiful, like, that deep. My son likes to come out every, every day and check out all the different instruments I have and always goes to the cello first. <laughs> yeah, there's something about it. For me, it's a memory of my father playing Sanson, oh, you know, and yeah. just that, am I going to throw you under the bus? Oh, I can't, I can't play that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. But... I was never an orchestra guy. I was never right. a classical player. Right. I can fake it a little bit, but not, you know, not right. like those guys. Like, they can sit down and read and, you know. Yeah. I can yeah. read, but I'm not like, you know, the film score guys who can just pick it up and sure. play perfectly the first time. Those are the people I hire when I need others to, <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> to play live for me. But. That's, I mean, it's just a beautiful sounding instrument. And I have these kinds of things. Ah! Uh, the open tuning square neck lap guitars, which That. that was beautiful. Yeah, sure. Can you play that again? Oh, yeah. I've never seen anybody play with that same, uh, that technique of like uh, putting your fingers on it. No, oh. with it when you were doing with this kind of instrument, you have to. If you don't, there's too much like yeah. resonance from behind, so you have to kind of hold it back. Plus, it helps me like if I'm bending up into a into a note, I can anchor my yeah. back fingers so I don't go too high. Yeah, you know, I don't make it sharp. Are you doing these low dead notes? Like that, you mean? Yeah. Very expressive. Do that again, that boy. Yeah. <laughs> That's really expressive. I love that. A guy named Steve Kimock taught me all I know about, about this instrument. Who and he learned from David Lindley, so there you go. We got, you know. <laughs> that's, that's a good lineage. So one thing I've shown people who've been playing this for 25, 30 years, I've always shown one little trick that they never know. When you bend into a note, instead of going straight, you bend into it. Oh. Do that again? This is amazing. <laughs> so you get the it's bend, got a real, like a blue. It's a sweepy kind yeah. of. So it's always kind of rounded, like. That's amazing. 
I think you might have just changed a lot of people's lives yeah, on that one. I hope so. Good. <laughs> you don't mind. So, you know, it's all, what it's all about is teaching. Absolutely. Uh, teaching, you know, the, the next generation, just like we learned how from the last generation, right? Absolutely. <laughs> So we, we did all those off records. Yeah, 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 exactly. Now, God bless YouTube, you can learn so much. Ah, uh, that's true. So what's this up here? That's basically the same as this one. Um, just has a resonator instead. Is, of it, a, is it a national or is it a... I don't know, it's a radio tone. A radio tone. It had been hanging up in the wall on Guitar Center and Sunset. Yeah. And, and I was walking by it. And I was like, asked one of the guys, how much is that? He didn't know. He's like, probably 200 bucks. I think right. he just wanted to sell it. I don't think it was supposed to be for sale. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, sure, but, for 200 bucks, I'll take it. Yeah. Hell yeah. It's a pretty cool instrument. It looks fantastic. I love the lightning bolts. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Nice Les Paul up there. 75. 75. S smoky, su smoky burst. Yeah, I don't know that color. I don't know that color very much. Very someone, well. Someone put some of these on. Um, it's got a very defined two-piece, you know, yeah. all the way around, which I guess was pretty common back then. But uh, yeah, it's, it plays great. Awesome neck on this thing. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> well, and while we're getting into it. it, it's a Les Paul. While we're getting into these things. Oh yeah. It was the seventies. Every guitar yeah. I played from the 70s have been customized yeah. and had phase switches and <laughs> yeah, right. coil taps. Yep. Yeah. So that's my Fender, the Super Champ. Oh, I love that. That was uh, Rivera's design when he worked at Fender, which didn't last, he, I think he was only there a year, and I think he kept the patent when he left, so they were never able to remake Colton it. mid? Yeah. I'm gonna turn it off for a second, because that's what these amps do. Oh, <laughs> is that that's the yeah? Now you want to hear a really good sounding oh, amp. So beautiful. If you coming think, through this little here. tiny mic, if you think that's good. This amp, play, play, play really light for a second. And as soon as you start putting, putting some weight into it, it gets really beefy. fantastic ah. it's got some low mids like yeah. where do those come from yeah. I don't know. The, so the dearm and i had i had been on tour in the 90s i was searching every music store I'd, I'd, in every town i went to to yeah. try and find this amp finally i found one and i walked into the store the, the guy was like oh we get them sometimes we don't have any now and then i searched around the source found it behind another amp ended up paying like 325 and then you know, shipping it home. Very next month, it was on the cover of Vintage Guitar Magazine, the same amp. Wow. I'm like, ah, I got it just you in got time. got it just before it doubled <laughs> in price or trebled like, even. At least. <laughs> so there's such... The, the tone, the distortion that comes out of this amp is just so gorgeous. Yeah. Buddy of mine at um, Mesa Boogie gave me a put a little line output jack on it, made me a little box line yep. output box, um, so I can send it into a bigger amp if I want. Yeah, and like that into the JC120 is huge. Wow. Like I used to do, use that when I was playing at the Fillmore and places like that. What that, is this? This looks beautiful. This is an old Supro. Here, let's use the same. I just love how simplistic it looks. Yeah. So it's super Ozark. An Ozark. <laughs> it's, 
It's got oh, the yeah. same kind of um, pickup as a uh, lap steel. Yeah. As the old Supro lap steels. That which is that's amazing. You know, the, the Rye Cooter style, you know. Yeah. Rye had, had put one of these and then the old uh, Italian, whatchamacallit, Italian pickup in. Well, when, you were, when you were demonstrating, when you were demonstrating earlier the, uh, the, the, the kind the of sweep. bloom, the sweep, yeah. I was thinking, that's so Raikuda. Yeah, right. Another one of those, like, you know, three, four hundred dollar finds at Guitar Center that's actually yeah. a pretty cool instrument, but, you know. A nice little I love the way it looks. Yeah, it's a fun one. Can I have a quick look at it? Sure. I'm I'm, I'm quite excited. <laughs> it plays great too. I mean I didn't do anything but cover the name. <laughs> oh, I put some sprinkles on it, some some uh tuners. I love it. It's fun, right? It's, yeah, it looks know. great. And it balances really well. Yeah. Considering it. And I like the uh, locking machine heads. Did you put these on? I put those on, yeah. Good idea. I love it. It's mm -hmm. like, a, it's one of those guitars where he's like, what is that? Yeah, exactly. So it's called a Talmax Artcore. The Artcore was the style, I guess. Wow. Yeah. I'm gonna look out for this. What else have we got yeah. hiding around? We have, uh, what's this uh, black strat down here? That's what's actually it? a Fender Lead 2. That's been a oh, little yeah, bastardized. I I remember those. Those were those were like the only guitars we could afford when we were kids. Yeah, right. right. You wanted a Defender, and they're actually they're pretty cool. It's um, it's you know it's got a humbucker and a and a single coil. Um, great neck. It's an actual Fender, <laughs> even though someone might have changed the neck, um, and because there's no you know no logo, and then obviously the I love the dice. <laughs> Lead but two. if I ever need, if I'm ever playing like hard rock or anything that needs really fast, kind of, this is the guitar. Because it's, it's so, it's such a short scale and it's easy to get around, you know. <laughs> and it records well, too. That balances really well. Mm -hmm. Aww. Tell me about this lovely Strat. I bought this Strat in 88, I believe, 89, something like that. And it was a... Uh, an 83 that they were trying to save a little money at the time and, and instead of having the input jack and the body they were just going to put it in the, the yeah. hole with, where the other tone control would be so since it was already kind of a weird weird strat anyway i switched uh pickups on it yep and turned the tone control into two volumes so i have a three position with this volume and then this one's just on its own for the middle so i can go any I can get both, I can get just one, or I can get two or all three. Oh, nice. And I can blend them too, like however much I want, so. That's kind of cool. Yeah. I'd like to hear that, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> all right, <laughs> if you want to well, hear yeah, it. No time by the present. I want to hear it through the Fender. Yeah. Yeah, that's it's kind of a favorite amp of mine. I used uh, to have this amp. Oh yeah? Oh, you have the, the Super Champ? Yeah. Nice. The switch only controls the outside two. Okay. The volume only for the center, and this volume for the outside two. Okay, so if I turn this down, turn that, I've got just the center. Just the center, there you go. Turn that, I've got all three. Yep. Pretty tasty sound. And I put the noiseless picks up, pickups in, put the spurtzels on the headstock, and that's about it. It's great. And then as far as tone, as far as tone, I, I pretty much rely on the way I play it and where I'm hitting the 
strings if I'm yeah. using my fingers or just a pick, yep. you know, as, to get the tone out of it. It's great. Like. Wow, that's a great neck pickup. Mm. Whew. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, what else have we got? What else have we got? What's you got some bass world here? Seventy-five P bass, and that's a uh, Alvarez. That's I bought super cheap, but yeah, I got this super cheap too. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, it's fun. <laughs> it's fun. got the big fat baseball neck. You know? yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And they're cheap Alvarez, and then what's this beautiful looking Martin? We this have is here? a 77 HD28. It was the second year they started reproducing the HD model. Yep. Um, one of the best sounding and playing. It plays great all the way up and down, it records amazingly well. Gorgeous. <laughs> I like this. I'm, this is fun just to be able to pick up all these guitars. I put oh, a Highlander so pickup on the bridge, and this is a volume control right here. Oh, wow, it's so smooth. Yeah. Strings are a little dead right now, but. Yeah, but it makes it gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. Gorgeous. We did skimp over the uh, piano. What is this? This is an old 1930s Gulbrunson Chicago piano. It's got a funky kind of in between an upright and a grand yeah. sound. Sits really nice in songs. I don't play piano at all. So. <laughs> but it's got it's it's I have other people come over and play who are you know so much better than me and it it always records really well. Beautiful. I love the contrast with the ribbon mics also on the piano. It just takes a little of that edge off of it and and just kind of warms it up a nice nice amount. Wonderful. I see a couple so. of lap steels up there. Three different lap steels. Four. 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 Sorry, <laughs> I can I can count. Hey. Uh, yeah, I love the lap steel. They all have different tune tunings and they all have a. Kind of a different tone as well. Got the banjo. Yeah. That, that's an electric acoustic oud. Oh, wow. And a couple of 12 strings. Wow. And what's that? Is yeah. this an ovation sitting that's over there? That's an ovation nylon guitar that the cousin gave me. <laughs> Great. And you have a PA in here. Is that so you can get uh, playback? I have rooms? a PA. I use it sometimes for playback. Um, mm -hmm. I use it for some of the artists I produce. Sometimes I'll have them come in and rehearse so I can right. kind of get the shit live show together. Um, it's a great idea. And then I sometimes have parties and I bring it outside and, you know, it's nice right. to have. <laughs> that's wonderful. I love the old, that's a 20-some year old DW drum kit that used to tour with Cheryl Crow. Right. With, uh, Wally Ingram's drummer was the drummer for this. I got it from him. Fantastic. Um, and you're using the Mojave's, you've got 57, uh, TLM. 112, and then, yeah, TLM 103. Yep. What are these on tones? Uh, oh, they're sure. Sure, yeah. Oh, okay, drum, great. Their drum kit, like, you know, set. Great. Fantastic. Um, I use another Mojave on the underneath also. Oh, I see, yeah. MA100. Fantastic. And then you have some kungas and some bongos. Kungas, bongos, lots of other percussion toys. <laughs> B15. Oh, I like that little... Oh, JC120. Yeah, the old Got to have a JC120. <laughs> Look at that. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. And then over there behind Eric, if he flips oh, yeah. around, there's a basement. That's a beautiful old uh, yeah. 68, 69 basement head. And then the cabinet I had made um, by this guy, these guys up in Marin County that matched it. I mean. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. It's a beautiful cabinet. It's an oversized single 12. Yeah. Um, gives it a nice, nice big you know, low end. Would you like to mic it with? Um, 
you know, usually I'll put a 57 really close and then sometimes a Royer or sometimes, you know, depending on, on yeah. what I'm going for, sometimes I'll just leave a room mic on six feet away and, you know, and yeah. see how it sounds. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that makes sense. Wonderful. I've seen some of the sort of um, uh, photos of, of some of the Beatle recordings where the mic is yeah. this far back. Yeah, you know, right. It's, it's like six feet back at least. You know, because they're worried about SPL, and also they just didn't right. want it to be like up close yeah. sounding. They wanted the low end, but they didn't want it to a be a little like bit of the room. Here. And, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and this basement has actually been turned into a Class A, so it's you know for guitar it breaks up at a lower volume. Oh, and it sounds sounds great. Before we wrap up and ask a couple of questions, yeah. I see you have the obligatory NS10s. Oh yeah, which we all grew up with the old uh, Halfler. So yeah. a Hafler? Okay, yeah. great. I see you have the trash can. I got the trash can. As it's commonly known. Yeah, I got the the Avid S3. Avid S3. Mixing console. You're in Pro Tools. Which is great to, you know, have actual hands-on, you know, time with with the Pro Tools, you know. Yep. And I love I love how the, the my version of Pro Tools matches the board. Right. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And then last but not means least, you're using the Rocket 8s. Uh, what, what do you prefer to use monitor or mix on? What's your preference? I, usually I use the Rocket 8s for almost everything until oh, okay. final mixes. I'll listen through the, the NS10s just to, you know a few times to make sure everything's kind of cohesive and, and it's not sticking out or it sounds good. The reason um, why I'm looking under here, so mm -hmm. you do have a sub. I do. The KRK sub. Are you yep. using the KRK sub with the NS10s or are you using it? Sometimes. I mean, I have, with the central station, I'm able to turn yep. the sub on and off easily enough with either speaker. So, right. so you know, I'll listen different different ways. Great. Um, well, this has been absolutely yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Oh, UAD. UAD. You have two of the satellites there. I love those oh. also. you got two, so you have a lot of plug-in power. Yeah. Plus, okay. I use that and I use a lot of wave stuff as well, which is, you know, they're both... Some people love one or the other. I think they both have some great, oh, I agree. great things. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, check back on Wednesday if you're watching this on Monday. If you're watching this after Wednesday, go back to Wednesday's video <laughs> because um, Steve e has very generously allowed us to give away a whole tracking session, Ooh. which we filmed, and the multitrack. So you're going to get to play with them, and you're going to get to know more about how you do all of this. And feel free to do some remixing. I'd love to hear it. Do some reviews. <laughs> Thank you ever so much. I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Have a bunch <laughs> of comments and questions below. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing, and we'll see you all again very, very soon. Happy holidays. Happy if you're holidays. If you're still watching this during the holidays. Yeah.